Well, hi, everybody, um, and welcome to Cosmic Coffee. I'm uh, Jeff Hall, an astronomer and the director at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. We're back with Cosmic Coffee after a, a busy fall hiatus. We've been trying to decide, is this Cosmic Coffee season two, or maybe it's Cosmic Coffee, the next generation. But whatever, we're happy to be back, and we've got some, uh, I think, some interesting shows lined up for you. Uh, for November, I'm broadcasting to you this morning from, as you can see, the surface of Pluto's moon, Charon. The forecast here is continued fair and chilly, so um, hope all of you are having a nice morning as well. Um, I'm joined this morning by uh, astronomer and faculty member here at Lowell, uh, Dr. Nick Moskovitz. Um, Nick is a specialist in small objects near the Earth, and often on Cosmic Coffee, we try to amplify a little bit of some of the current things in the news, and that's what we've decided to do this morning. Uh, you may have seen recent uh, flurry in the media about the so-called mini moon, and these are kind of interesting little objects out there, and Nick has graciously agreed to join us and give us a little bit of a behind-the-scenes look on how this, this new mini moon was discovered and what we've what we've learned about it. So uh, welcome, Nick. Uh, glad to have you here. Thank you. And I, I thought maybe we could start this morning by setting a bit of context and just talking about moons in general. You know, when we look across the solar system, there's a lot of them and they kind of come in different flavors from big to small. So maybe we could just sketch that out for everybody and then we'll get into the, the mini moons. Sure. And you're sitting on one right now, apparently. Uh, you know, and I am. The, you know, there's maybe a, a valid question of whether that's a moon or a binary planet that you're at, but uh, um, yeah, there's a there's an interesting continuum of objects out there in the solar system from things that are quite large and, and compared to the, the host planet in which they're orbiting down to the so-called mini moons that we're finding now in near Earth space where these things are incredibly tiny and we may get into how small these objects actually are, but they're, you know, sort of uh, not, not the sort of global worlds with complex geology and surface features and mountains and things like that that you may associate with a planetary scale body, but instead are sort of small little rocks that are out there. Um, but even though the, the, these mini moons and some of the, the other sort of smaller uh, satellites and quasi-satellites that are out there in orbit around the other planets are small, it doesn't mean they're less important. Uh, they actually have a, a wealth of information to be able to teach us about uh, the solar system and uh, are, are uh, important for a number of practical reasons that again I think we'll probably get into uh, over the course of our discussions. We certainly will and as with the usual sort of, of power law kind of thing we have going here there's not too many of the great big ones but just tons of these little facts. <laughs> that's right and uh, I that's maybe a, a decent segue into I, I threw together some slides here just as sort of talking points for us to, to go over and if I do a quick screen share here. Uh, okay. Uh, there we go. So there's a ton of the little things, right? And uh, this is a, an overview, sort of a bird's eye view of the solar system. And you know, this aside from maybe giving our viewers a bit of a headache, this is meant to highlight that there's a lot of small stuff out there in the solar system. So every uh, light blue circle that we see in here is the orbit of one of the major planets. So we have the sun at the middle. We have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then at the perimeter here, we have Jupiter. So this is sort of what we would call the inner solar system. And every dot in this image is a minor planet. And that could be a comet. It could be a main belt asteroid, which are shown in green. It could be a near Earth asteroid, which are shown in red. Um, but the, the clear take home here is there's a lot of stuff out there. And actually just uh, uh, about a month or so ago, maybe two months ago now, uh, our catalog of known minor planets in the solar system um, grew larger than a million objects. So we now know of over a million minor planets in the solar system, which is a staggering number, um, and certainly in comparison to the dozen or so planets and dwarf planets that we know of in the solar system. So while these objects are small, they far outnumber the major planets in the solar system. And again, they have a lot to teach us about, about the solar system. Yeah, clearly vastly outnumbering. And there's a lot of interesting taxonomy in here because there, there's also those two uh, dark blue clouds that kind of inhabit Jupiter's orbit. Those are in, sort of in stable points right in its orbit. 
Th yeah, that's exactly right. And those you know, are very much related to sort of moons and quasi satellites. Those are what we refer to as the Trojans. And so uh, Jupiter, again, Jupiter is the outer ring here, that's the orbit of Jupiter. And then leading and trailing Jupiter in its orbit are these clouds of, in this case, sort of dark blue dots that we refer to as Trojans. And so they are in an orbital resonance with Jupiter, which means every time Jupiter goes around the sun once, they go around the sun once. And so they always sort of stay a safe distance away from Jupiter. In this diagram, Jupiter would be up near the top here. Um, and these asteroids are just sort of following Jupiter around in its orbit um, and are long-term stable. They've been there uh, essentially since the current architecture of the solar system has been established. Um, and they're in some sense sort of part of this continuum of satellites and mini moon type of objects in the sense that they're on um, very similar orbits to Jupiter and you know Jupiter would see these objects in its night sky as sort of quasi satellites that mm -hmm. uh, undergo interesting um, uh, apparent motions in its night sky. Yeah, and you mentioned that that word resonance, which of course has a huge role in the, the dynamical evolution of the solar system. And you can't see it here in the green, but there's lots of, of places in that main belt where you don't see a lot of asteroids just because you're sort of at a, a two to one, three to one orbital ratio instead of the one to one. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, these minor planets, are, are their, their lifetimes are dictated by the perturbations they feel uh, from the major planets. So, you know, Jupiter and all the other major planets are so much more massive than every one of the dots in this image that they're going to feel pushes and pulls from those planets that dictate what happens over their lifetime. And so those pushes and pulls actually sculpt the shapes of these populations um, so that they... Yeah. Um, uh, have edges and there's regions where they're depleted and regions where they're enhanced and it's all because of this sort of uh, gravitational dance between the planets and these minor planets um, that, that um, in some cases is tied directly to the resonant um, interactions not just yeah. one to one resonance like the trojans but two to one resonance three to one resonance and up, up uh, uh, as high as you can count essentially yeah. yep higher, higher orders right and higher order resonance too well so the, i guess the push and the pull is probably a good segue into this this mini moon which clearly got pulled uh by earth so um so 2020 cd3 which is this exciting romantic name for this little object um so let's let's talk about the the discovery and how we how we found this and then proceeded sure. to try and understand it sure um, I have another slide. Yeah, so this is that's a good segue into the next slide. And this is, you know, maybe the bigger picture context of what's been going on in our community and our community being sort of those who are involved in minor planet discovery and, and characterization. Uh, this is what's been going on in our community for the past 20 years. And um, what this shows is essentially just the number of asteroids, in this case, near Earth asteroids, all those red dots that were in the previous diagram. Uh, this is the number of near-Earth asteroids discovered over time. And you can see that right around the year 2000, as a very, various factors contributed to increased efficiency and increased number of facilities coming online, we really have done an amazing job in discovering a huge number of these near-Earth asteroids. Um, and our, our current population is approaching 25,000 known near-Earth asteroids. And so these are objects that you know, their name is apt. They, they come near the Earth. There's a technical definition, but this is the sort of population of, of asteroids in the solar system that we get an up-close look at, and, um, simply because they do come close to the Earth. Uh, and it's this sort of increased productivity of the discovery surveys, and there's a number of them operating around the world, some of them right here in Arizona. One of the, the most productive discovery surveys is the Catalina Sky Survey down in uh, Tucson. Um, it's because of the, the, the productivity of these, these surveys uh, that we're finding more and more exotic objects. Um, and there's a whole host of interesting objects that are being found from small asteroids on pre-Earth impacting trajectories to uh, some of these you know, sort of quasi-satellites and mini-moons that are now being found. And uh, the most recent of these, 2020 CD3, is uh, now the second known uh, mini moon of the Earth. Uh, the first one was discovered back in 2006, um, also by the Catalina Sky Survey. Um, both, both CD3 and um, RH120 were discovered by the Catalina Sky Survey. Um, 
and the, these sort of fortuitous discoveries of really interesting objects is largely just a testament to how good the surveys are getting at being able to find these small, difficult to detect objects as part of their survey operations. And it's you know, a combination of the technology as well as the computers and the systems that run these surveys that allow them to be able to find more and more of these interesting objects. Yeah, and you mentioned um, you know potential impactors, and and one thing people frequently ask about is sort of the relative hazard level. You know, I, I always enjoyed you know your, your predecessor at Lowell, uh, Ted Bowl, who was a, a preeminent uh, asteroid researcher, would always. I, I love the slide he would start his talk with with three sentences saying, you know, a giant asteroid is going to hit the Earth. We are all going to die. Not in that order. And, yeah. and you can, I think, kind of see that here. Where where do we get to the point where where we're sort of seeing seriously hazardous objects. There are not that many of them. Right. I mean, I, I, I get asked this question a lot, oftentimes before people even find out that I work specifically on impact hazard and hazardous <laughs> right. asteroids. You know, once people find out that you're an astronomer, they want to know when is the next you know, dinosaur killing asteroid going to come along. Right. And I tell people that I don't lose sleep over this, uh, that we're really, um, again, getting very good at, uh, at finding the, the asteroids in general, and certainly the large ones. And that shows up a little bit here in this plot where you can see the different colors in this diagram correspond to the different size objects that we're finding. And so you can see this small little wedge down here at the bottom has pretty much leveled off since 2010. And those are the largest near-Earth asteroids. These are the dinosaur killers. And the reason this is leveled off and is not increasing anymore is we've essentially discovered the entirety of that population. There aren't any more out there left to find with the, the exception of you know, one or two. <laughs> um, right. So we've largely extinguished the risk associated with large sort of extinction level event impacts because we know of all of those objects. We're able to track them. We know where they are and we know that none of them pose an immediate threat. And that's, Kind of an amazing thing to think about that yeah. you know, the the course of life on this planet has that that's never been said right that yeah. uh, we we actually ha have made enough progress to do something about major impacts um, um, as as sort of a, a life ending event on the earth and you know, if we did you know find one of these objects that is going to impact and that impact would be likely decades or even centuries off in the future, we would have enough time to do something about it. We wouldn't just have to sit idly by and watch the thing come in and smack us. Um, so there's a lot of effort now in the community trying to get this middle um, swath of, of objects to level out as well, essentially to discover all of those 140 meter sized objects. Um, and while those would not be necessarily mass extinction event impacts, those could do some damage if they impacted over a populated area. And so, of course, we right. do want to find those and be able to understand where they are and track them in the same way we do the very large objects. Right. So if we're um, you know, trying to evaluate risk levels in our daily lives, we, we might pay much more attention to say, oh, I don't know, a virus running out of control than a giant sure. asteroid coming in. <laughs> or even crossing the street during rush hour, you know? Yeah, so, yeah exactly. Um, yeah. And again, you kind of see that, that power law going along here where, like we said before, there's just not many of these huge things and just tons of these little ones where the curve is still rising rapidly. Yeah. Okay, so then I guess this particular mini moon itself, um, I know we did some observations uh, right at where you are at the Global Discovery Telescope and we're able to characterize this. So yeah, talk about that a bit. Yeah, sure. Let me switch over. So I can show a few slides here. Um, and few, um, Yeah, any questions into the YouTube chat? We'll, we'll yeah, or ask questions as they come up. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we can talk a little bit about mini moons specifically as a, as a population, and there's only two of them known, so it's not much of a population yet, but we do know that these two represent a much larger collection of bodies that have yet to be discovered. Um, so these things are on temporarily captured orbits, and I'll show an example of what that actually means in just a bit. Um, but essentially, it's a small asteroid that comes into the Earth-Moon system and gets captured by the Earth-Moon, the gravi gravitational well of the Earth and the Moon, and they orbit around the Earth and Moon for a while and then get kicked out due to those same sort of gravitational interactions. And they typically hang around for about a year or so. Um, again, we only have two of these, so we don't really have good numbers on that, and this is all sort of model 
driven in the sense that we try to model what happens to these objects when they get into uh, the Earth Moon system and how long they stick around. But we think, you know, sort of six months, a year, two years kind of thing would be typical. And these models predict that the Earth has one one meter mini moon at any time. So when I was saying that these things are small, they really are small. They're sort of you know medium dog sized uh, objects, <laughs> right? They're not they're not even car sized. Um, and uh, uh, CD three definitely falls into that sort of you know uh, small category. Um, as I said, there's two of these things that have been discovered. The first one was 14 years ago with 2006 RH 120. This one was about two meters in size. It hung around for about a year and then left the system. But it comes back every 20 years or so. And uh, it, when it comes back, it can get recaptured and hang around for another year and then get kicked out again. Uh, and then the one that we'll be focusing on here in just a bit, uh, 2020 CD3, it was discovered uh, in February this year. It's about one meter in size. And uh, again, we'll kind of get more into detail on that. I wanted to mention another object, 2020 SO, which has also been in the news. Uh, this is purely coincidental that, that both CD3 and S2020 SO are in the news right now. Um, 2020 SO was discovered, um, I believe, by the Pan Stars survey in Hawaii <coughs> and was thought to be an asteroid. And so it was given this sort of, you know, not very interesting phone book designation. <laughs> uh, so we, we track this object now as if it's an asteroid, but as data has been collected, uh, we've come to realize that, okay, this is this object's behaving strange in a number of ways. Um, um, and uh, various uh, uh, analysis techniques, including sort of looking at how the orbit of this object has changed over time, as well as I just saw yesterday, actually, some press releases about the, the reflectance properties of this object suggest that it is absolutely not a natural object, not a rock, but um, uh, most likely a piece of space junk. And we think we've, a um, uh, uh, group at uh, JPL thinks that they've tracked uh, 2020 SO uh, back to um, a booster um, stage uh, from a launch in the 60s uh, for oh. a, a moon lander. Um, so oh. this is a, a mission known as the Surveyor 2 mission, which was going to sort of pre-Apollo um, lander that was going to survey the moon. And one of the cool things that Surveyor 2 was going to do was going to land and then take off and land somewhere else and look, essentially hop, and then look at what happened to the first landing site in terms of um, perturbing the lunar surface because there was open debate about what the actual lunar surface was going to be like. And so right. this was going to be an experiment to do that in preparation for that astronaut's arrival. Uh, unfortunately, the, the surveyor spacecraft was lost. Uh, that, um, that mission did not happen. Um, I don't know the details of that. Uh, but the rocket body that launched surveyor um, it has come back, essentially. So, um, you know, 60 years later now, not quite 60 years later, 50 years later, this thing has come back into the Earth-Moon system, got captured into one of these sort of mini-moon-like orbits, um, and we'll hang around for a while until it gets kicked out. Um, but again, um, it's, it's not a mini moon because we're pretty confident it is a rocket body. Um, so anyways, uh, talking about CD3 here, this is you know, one of the drivers for uh, the, us discussing about this now is that this paper just came out and I'm a distant seventh author on this paper <laughs> um, down here in the second line. So uh, the, the people that are listed up, up top here really did the, um, and uh, are, are really the sort of true experts in uh, many about two weeks ago. And uh, um, with the detection of the second, this second mini moon 2020 CD3, we now have uh, with the, that full population, we characterize this object and Okay, 
we understand from the technical crew behind the scenes, our broadcast software is back online. It's apparently been a little glitchy lately. So if we drop in and out, bear with us and we will, we'll be back as soon as we can. So I think um, sort of the, the, the main other thing we wanted to talk about with this, this new little object was just what we learned as we tried to characterize it. And, and so, yeah. So there, as I was saying, I don't know when we actually got cut off, but there was two main things we did out at LDT. I could show LDT. Um, and two main things we did out at LDT uh, related to this object. One was trying to track its orbit over time. So if you watch the object long enough, you can essentially connect the dots and figure out where the object is going and be able to track its trajectory. And that was done over um, several months, not just with LDT, but other facilities as well. And uh, essentially from its February discovery of this year through to about May, uh, when the object left the Earth-Moon system, we were able to collect images and use those images to measure the position on the sky of the object, and then using those positions, fit an orbit to the object. And there are a number of interesting things related to that, but one of them, and I can show this here, one of the, one of the things we can do when we have an orbit is we can do cool animations. And so... Ah. Here at the middle is Earth, and then the moon is in, is the, the ring here, and near the bottom of the image. And what we're looking at is the orbit of CD3 over the couple months that we observed it. Um, actually, I, sh I shouldn't say that. It's, it, this is uh, over a couple year time span when we think, when we can predict where CD3 was, was with some certainty. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But you can see what it it's like to be a mini moon. It's not a nice, you know, uh, elliptical orbit around a central body, but it's this sort of crazy curly Q pattern that this thing is uh, yeah. experiencing as it first enters the earth moon system and then is interacting with the earth, the moon, and then the sun is, you know, of course, influencing the, the orbit of the object as well. And it undergoes this almost chaotic trajectory before finally getting ejected out of the system. It experiences a close, um, encounter with the Earth, which is why the object got discovered. Uh, it experiences that close encounter, and then the Earth kicks it out of the system. And uh, it's now in sort of interplanetary space, um, and I don't know if and when it will be coming back. Um, right. Uh, um, and it does look like, speaking of close encounters, um, the perigee right when the video gets to about the second A in NASA looks really close, um, un unless that's just a projection effect. I, you know, I, I agree with you. There, th that may be in the paper. You're kind of talking like right there. Right there, yeah. Yeah. It could be a projection effect. There were, it's on this, I mean, yeah, this looks like a crazy orbit, but from a discovery perspective, it's actually really tough to discover an object like this because it's so highly inclined. Yeah. So that it's, you know, most of the time it's way out far off near the poles or something like that. And yeah, right. Faint. And it's really only when it sort of whizzes down through the, the close to the earth do we have any hope at all of discovering it. And even then, you kind of have to be looking in the right place at the right time because those flybys are so quick. Right, because then it's going really fast the closer it is. So, yeah, yeah. it's like so, everything conspires against you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there were potential opportunities to discover it sometime. This video starts, you can see the timestamp at the beginning. This video starts in September of 2017. 17. Wow. Yeah. There were times throughout this two-year animation where we could have had a chance of discovering it with our current assets if we were looking at the right place at the right time, but we were not. Uh, so instead, we caught it during its last sort of plunge in, into you know, its cl close Earth approach. And then, as I said, after that, it got flung out. And you can see that at the end of the video here. Yeah, it just sort of oh, yes. tails off into the upper left corner of the... The, the the screen here and uh, again has left the earth moon system at that point. so are the dynamics such that it it the dynamics of the counter if it gets kicked out it's kicked out in such a way that inevitably brings it back to the earth moon system or can you have a completely kind of hyperbolic ejection and it just goes off somewhere else it's a great question and I, i'm not sure i have an answer to that okay. one. I, I i if i had to guess i would guess that Yes, anything is possible. Okay. Um, and it's all about the details of, you know, these curly cues, essentially, right? What is the actual encounter distance with the Earth, yeah. encounter velocity, um, how much of the kick does it get as it, you know, swings by the Earth, and, um, you know, will it, will we see it again? And I, I don't know. Um, 
I can talk a little bit about why this movie starts at 2017 and it kind of gets into the, you know, what we can do with these objects. So the, the movie starts here at 2017. And that's about as far back as we can predict where this object was. And the reason for that is, is that at 2017, let me forward this just a little bit. Mm -hmm. There we go. That's one of the first frames. You can see here the moon is showing. I don't know how well this shows up, but the moon yeah. is sort of the top part of the ellipse here. Right. And CD3 is at the top part of the ellipse. And at this time in mid-September of 2017, CD3 and the moon had a very close encounter. And whenever one of these objects is discovered, there's essentially three possibilities. Whenever these sort of mini moon-like objects are discovered, there's three possibilities. One is it's a natural object. It's an asteroid from out there in the solar system that is being captured by the moon as it comes in. Two, it could actually be a piece of ejecta from the moon. So if you had something else impact the moon and kick pieces off of the surface, say, oh, yeah. a, you know, a, a crater forming event that kicks ejecta off of the moon, that can actually masquerade as one of these mini moons. And the third possibility is space junk. We kind of talked about that already with 2020 SO. Um, so whenever one of these is discovered, we're interested in figuring out, okay, is it an asteroid? Is it a piece of the moon or is it space junk? And there are reasons for being interested in each of those categories. I personally am interested in the, the first, you know, with the, the natural objects that tell us something about solar system processes. Um, but that's part of the game here is you find these, these surveys find these objects and we know, okay, we found this object. It looks like it's on one of these sort of exotic mini moon micro orbits. What is the object now? And that was a big part of the effort in this paper that I, that I mentioned uh, was trying to figure out whether or not this object was natural or not. Right. And so what we can do is we can take the observations that we collected in 2020. We determine an orbit for the object. And of course, there's uncertainty in that orbit. And so we can propagate that uncertainty backwards in time and see what happened to the object, not in 2020, but in 2019, 2018, 2017, and so on and so forth. And that's what this figure here essentially is showing, where it's, it's a bit of a complicated figure, but it's actually not too bad. Um, if you take the position of uh, 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 CE3 in 2020 and model where it was back in 2017, so you essentially you know, integrate that orbit backwards over time, you find a number of possible scenarios based on our uncertainty associated with the position of that object. And this diagram shows those possible scenarios. So at the time of September 15th, 2017, if we look at sort of this reference frame tied to the moon, we see that about 97% of our particles that we're testing um, experience a capture at that time, meaning it's an asteroid from interplanetary space that comes in, experiences this close encounter with the moon, and gets captured as a mini moon. 1% of the particles look like they came off of the moon. So if we take 1% of those particles from the current epoch and integrate them back to 2017, it looks like about 1% of those particles could have got kicked off the moon. And then another 1% or so look like they may just have been in the Earth-Moon system before that encounter in 2017. But it's this encounter that really adds chaos in the sense that we can't really determine, deterministically predict what the object was doing before this, this key date in 2017. And that's often the case for these mini moons and objects like this, that you only can go back so far in time before you're kind of out of luck and you can't really figure out what, uh, what the object was doing. But it's these simulations that pretty strongly suggest that, in fact, this object was coming in from interplanetary space, encountered the moon, and it was that gravitational interaction that led it to being captured for, in this case, almost, you know, almost two years. Uh, it was in the Earth-Moon system before getting kicked out in May of this year. Uh, three years. Yep. Yep. And as we un undoubtedly this will happen again. And as we increase this population, you know, we can model those crazy curly Q orbits you showed and, and sort of begin to build up the statistics of what really happens as these things come in and out of our neighborhood. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And I have, and there's actually uh, sort of great prospects for that um, in the future. Um, and I put a, a dropped an image here of LSST. And so this is a, um, uh, the next generation discovery tool that, that many um, 
people in throughout the astronomy community are looking forward to yeah. uh, because it's going to absolutely revolutionize astronomy in ways that we can't even imagine yet. Um, so LSST or the Vera Rubin Observatory um, is being uh, built right now. Uh, it is, uh, this is, this image is a couple months old, um, but this is a pretty good assessment of the state of the facility. Um, yeah. You can see that uh, we've got sort of trucks for scale down in the bottom here. Yeah. This is a big building and a big telescope. Um, LSST is an eight meter telescope that will be scanning the night sky every couple of days to unprecedented depth. And it will, as I say, sort of revolutionize all areas of astronomy. Yeah. And part of that is discovering lots of new objects. And we expect um, as opposed to the current cadence of about one new mini moon discovery every 10 or 15 years, we're going to get about one new mini moon every year. Um, and so we actually will start building up a decent population of these objects as LSST uh, is sort of probing uh, uh, the cosmos in unprecedented depth. It's really going to revolutionize so many areas. And yeah. These small objects close to the Earth. Yeah, right. Um, so twice the aperture of LDT, uh, therefore four times the collecting area, right, and an enormous field of view. So the just, you know, dealing with the data volume coming out of this thing is going to be an amazing challenge. Um, That's right. Yeah. Building the facility is the easy part. Not that, not that it's easy at all. And it's an incredibly state, you know, it's an amazing facility. It's absolutely state of the art and incredibly complex, but uh, as much of a, a problem, uh, uh, it is, as you say, the sort of data management aspects of this. And one reason this building attached to the telescope is so big is there's essentially a, you know, a computer farm here, you know, a data center uh, that's going to have to crunch through these data, uh, you know, petabytes of data in, yep. in real time um, just to be able to get those results out into the community. And all areas of astronomy are thinking about, okay, how do we deal with a data stream of not, you know, a few megabytes per second, but gigabytes per second kind of thing. Yeah, right, right. And, and you know, it's a testament. We, we do have to shout out a testament to the engineers because, you know, this is remote. If you have driven up the road that goes up to that site, it is, you know, and imagine driving a flatbed up there with the components for this. It, it boggles the mind that they were able to achieve it. So it's tremendously exciting that we have facilities like this just about to, to come online. There's a lot of smart people working to make it happen and really, really change the, the whole parameter space for these kinds of studies and many others. So, oh, absolutely. As I say, every area of astronomy is going to just be, it's a new way of thinking, a new way of working. We're going to have to think about how to deal with these data. We are thinking about how to deal with the data streams and how to sort of find the most interesting objects because there's no way you can, anybody could put eyes on all the data that's coming through. You need to come up with com computer code and sophisticated algorithms to be able to parse all of that information and automatically pull out the, the most interesting objects that you're interested in. Yeah. Okay, well, I think um, if there are any other points you would like to add, Nick, feel free. I'll ask for any other questions from the viewers. Let's see if I do. I do want to touch on one of the, the sure. kind of cool things we did at LDT. This is the sort of the other side of the LDT observations. Okay. Uh, so I don't know how well this is showing up. I, I know the video has been choppy throughout this this talk um, or throughout our discussion here, but this is just a time series of images from one of the, inst the instruments that we used at LDT. Um, this is not CD3, but it's a decent representation of what the images of CD3 would look like. And for those with keen eyes, yeah. uh, what, you, what you're looking at is sort of a star field here. The white dots are stars. And then at the middle of the image here is a little blip that's moving through the frame. Yeah. And that is an asteroid in this case. And what we do with these images, in addition to sort of, as I mentioned earlier, connecting the dots to fit the orbit and be able to do those cool curly Q um, animations, um, we also can measure the brightness of the object over time. And the brightness of the object is changing over time. And one of the reasons is because CD3 is rotating in space. And so as it rotates, it's reflecting different amounts of sunlight. Um, it's not a sphere, it's a, sort of an elongated body. And that rotation um, causes brightness increases and decreases. And that was one of the key things we wanted to measure with LDT was what is the rotation rate of this object? And so taking images like this and measuring the brightness on each frame, we put together what's called a light curve. And this is really just showing the sort of periodic variation in brightness for the object. And so 
yeah, for those uh, in the you know technically minded, you know, again, this is a 23rd magnitude object, yeah. ridiculously faint. Um, but what we can see is the object getting fainter and brighter, fainter, and brighter again. And it does that periodically. And in this case, we were able to measure with pretty good confidence that this thing has a rotation period of about 0.05 hours, which is something like 190 seconds, just over three minutes. Yep. That seems pretty fast, you know, in sort of astronomical time scales, three minutes is, you know, <laughs> incredibly fast. But uh, this remains one of the puzzles of 2020 CD3 and mini moons uh, in general, um, meaning not just CD3, but RH120 as well, that both objects seem to have rotation periods of about three minutes, which is much slower than models predict these objects should be rotating. Mm -hmm. And we don't know why that is. Um, it could have something to do with the unusual dynamics of these objects that somehow gravitational interactions with the Earth and the Moon are causing their rotation states to change. I'm not sure I believe that, but we're kind of grasping at straws a little bit here. We we have two objects now that are part of this mini moon population, and both of them are what we would characterize as very slow rotators for objects of this size. Very slow by maybe even an order of magnitude. And so it tells us something's wrong with our models or with our predictions. It tells us we need more of these objects to study, and you know, we can't certainly base any, any substantial conclusions on just two objects, but it is something we'll be looking forward to in the coming years as LSST finds more of these objects and we're able to study them more. Are these all unusually slow rotators for some reason, or are we just happening to see that with the first two objects that have come along? Great, yeah, it's, it's not entirely uncommon that time series observations upend well-established. It is. Um, not in a what we would call a non-principal axis rotation. So that would be uh, the asteroid sort of tumbling through space as opposed to being, you know, spinning nice, right. nicely behaved in a, a, around a single axis. Um, so we can't rule that out. And there's certainly vague hints of that in these data. But again, that, I think that's you know, pushing the the interpretation of lo low signal to noise data a bit too far. But no, understood. It's just I mean, if we have if we had Dave Schleicher on here, our comet expert, you know, he would give you any number of objects that have caused him headaches because the jets indicate there's some really complex. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I don't envy his job when he has, you know, not just the nucleus spinning, but now you've got jets on all over the surface causing that nucleus to get torqued around all over the place. That's a, that's a tough problem. Oh, you got to come over to the dark side and do cool star atmospheres at some point. <laughs> there you go. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, See, any, any other points you'd like to bring up? Uh, I haven't seen questions come in on the stream. Maybe I'll ask uh, Heather and Danielle to call for any final questions. Um, um, otherwise, we'll say, um, anyway, that's kind of the story of our, our latest mini moon. Hopefully in the near future, as Nick said, we'll be finding many more of these interesting things, which will let us characterize what's going on uh, a little bit better. So, so until then, um, Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll we'll sign off now. Um, uh, next week, uh, as we've had a couple times on Cosmic Coffee, we're going to take a slight detour strictly from astronomy, and uh, we're fortunate here in Flagstaff to have top-notch uh, infectious disease experts. So, Dr. Dave Engelfaller, who's been on Cosmic Coffee before, will be back with us. We're going to talk a little bit about winter waves and just what's up with uh, the vaccines and how soon we're all going to be up from under this miserable situation we found ourselves in the week after. Um, that's actually getting really close to a neat event, which is a very close appearance in the sky of the giant planets Jupiter and Saturn, what we call a conjunction, which also happens to reach its, its apex right on the winter solstice. So that seems like a good week to talk about planetary motions and conjunctions and sort of the, the cardinal points of the celestial year as, as Earth's orientation causes the sun to reach certain critical points. So join us join us for the, the next two weeks, and then we'll, we'll continue to try to line up some interesting programs for you going forward. So until then, everybody, as always, stay well, stay health, all the best to everybody from all of us here at Lowell Observatory. Many thanks to Nick for your time joining and expertise joining us.